Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special Passover-themed Jewish Parents Forum discussion. My name is Caroline Brick, and I'm the Executive Director of Tikva's Jewish Parents Forum. I'm also a Jewish mother, and next week, along with Jewish mothers and fathers across the world, I will take on the role of Jewish educator as I sit down to participate in the sacred ritual of passing down our story to the next generation at our Passover Seder. The Seder is arguably the most central educational moment of the entire year. And it's conducted in our homes as families. In the Jewish tradition, we, the parents, are seen as the ultimate educational authority in our children's lives. Not our kids' schools or the government, but us, the parents. An authority cannot happen without responsibilities. As parents, we need to prepare ourselves for this moment and take it seriously. This is why we're sitting down to engage in this discussion, so we can explore together how to bring our best selves to our satyrs and how we can transform our homes into citadels of learning and inspiration for our children. I'm thrilled to be joined by the Tikva Fund's Rabbi Mark Gottlieb and Rabbi Herschel Lutch for a lively discussion about the power of the Seder to strengthen our children's Jewish identities and destinies. Thank you for being here. I'd like, to, I'd like to begin our discussion by sharing an observation that Rabbi Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory made, that in biblical Hebrew, there's no word for history. In fact, modern Hebrew had to borrow a word from English. And so we have the word historia. The closest word to history in the Hebrew Bible is zahor, which means memory. What's the difference between history and memory? And why is this such an important distinction for us to bear in mind as we sit down at our seders? Rabbi Gottlieb, let's start with you. Thanks so much, Caroline. Well, I love the quote from Rabbi Sachs. And as we all know, we're deeply indebted to Rabbi Sachs for his Torah, for his wisdom, for his creativity. This particular quote is not original to Rabbi Sachs. Uh, my dear friend, Rabbi Lutch, we both share a very revered Rebbe, a very revered teacher and mentor by the name of Rabbi Dr. Jacob J. Schachter, who has written very powerfully on this idea of Jewish memory and Jewish history. And his guru, his Rebbe in this, was, of course, the world historical scholar, really one of the greatest scholars of the 20th century, Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi who wrote a book called Zachor, Jewish Memory and Jewish History. And I think this observation that Hebrew, biblical Hebrew, does not have original to its own native language and its worldview, because, you know, languages are not mere instruments of expression. They contain ideas and they express ideas. So a, a language is really a worldview. A language is a way into a reality, into a whole philosophy. And Judaism does not have that word for history, but it instead has the word zahor for memory. And here I, I, I think of another great teacher and mentor, Rabbi Soloveitchik, who spoke so powerfully with the idea of Masora, of, of a kind of a, a heritage, of a tradition, of a community of, of Jewish people who remember the past, not as a academic matter, not as a purely theoretical or intellectual matter, but as a living, a living, breathing thing. It's almost like its own entity, that the, the Masora of the Jewish people is a living thing. It's an organism. It has its own life. It has its own personalities. Of course, Rabbi Salvatic has this beautiful image of all the great rabbis, the rabbis that we refer to in the Haggadah, the rabbis, Rabbi Akiva, his whole Hevra in Bnei Brak, that they come into our lives. They come into our rooms, into our worlds, and they mean something to us. Now, how does that happen? It only can happen if we cultivate in our children a sense of an awareness of the gravitas of this community, the, the importance of this community, and the approachability of this community. That these are not these iconic marble-like figures, but they're real living, breathing figures in our own lives. We should think about the forefathers and the, and the, the foremothers and matriarchs and the patriarchs as living 
realities in, in our own being, in our own day-to-day -day life. And I think that's the spirit in which the Haggadah is meant. It's, it's a conversation across the centuries. It's a conversation across the generations. It's meant to bring this alive to us. We don't just see ourselves that we once upon a time left Egypt, but the Rambam Maimonides says that the mitzvah is to see oneself as if we are leaving Egypt this very day. So that requires a whole transformation of our inner life, not just a theoretical knowledge of history or of the past. It's a living entity. It's a living reality. And, and that's the job of education. It's easy to say all this, but the job of education is to make this reality your reality. Make my reality my children's reality. My, as a teacher, my student need to see this as their reality. Now, that's, there's the rub. How do you do that? But that's what, it, that's what the task is, to, turn, to translate history into real memory. Thank you, Rabbi Gottlieb. Rabbi Lutch. I need to start by saying what an absolute pleasure it is to be here with both of you and our broader Tikva community. I'll, I'll build on an idea that you both shared. I think, Caroline, in your, in your opening remarks, you observed that this rarefied, singular, although I guess in the diaspora it happens twice, but still, this rarefied and singular educational moment that we call the Passover Seder happens in the home. Because as we understand it, the great authority of education, of of transmission is in fact the parent. But that doesn't mean the child doesn't have an active role to play. So as we sit down and we are not only opening up a history book, we're not only sharing stories that are removed in time and space and maybe even in reality from our current existence, but we are reliving, we're trying to dig deeper in that very same well to re-experience, that puts everybody around the Seder table front and center. If you're just memorializing something that was, I think you could ask, and everybody at a Seder could ask a very reasonable question, well, why do I need to do this? I Meaning it's very nice, every people has its history, but what's the impact on me? Why do I need to be present and an active participant? But if we look through the lens of how is this impactful upon my life? What might I need to do differently as I live my life because of these events that have transpired? It's a very different educational moment. Rabbi Lutz, you mentioned the child's active role to play in the Seder and our children as active partners, which is a great segue to my next question, which is, as we think about the character of the Seder, um, I think about the spirit of inquiry. At our seders, we do not indoctrinate, but we educate. And as we retell our story of peoplehood, we encourage our children to ask questions. And in this way, they learn to think critically and, and they become valued partners in the learning process. So on the one hand, we celebrate inquiry and we encourage our kids to ask questions. But on the other hand, our tradition instructs us in clear terms to teach our children sometimes very deliberately and specifically with an eye towards our truth. So how do we negotiate this tension? Right. The Haggadah, maybe more than any other Jewish text, tells us that there are hard and firm bounds to appropriate questions. Not all questions are welcome. That, that is a core message of the Haggadah, however provocative that may be. There are four questions and three of those four sons, I'm sorry, there are four sons, four questions, and three of those four sons come with an active question. They proffer words to their parent saying, what is this? What is this? Sometimes it's more detailed. Sometimes they say, what is this that we're sharing in common? But the, the, the wayward son says, what is this that you're doing? And our response is forceful and not terribly welcome. So to your point, there is a certain role for a parent and there's a certain role for a child, but that's not amorphous without any sense of, of boundary. What I find so striking is that at the Seder, the parent needs to wear this dual hat, the hat of parent 
and the hat of educator. But maybe there's a third hat that the parent needs to wear as well, which I think could be the most powerful value modeling that the parent does at the Seder, which is also wearing the hat of student. The greatest rabbis of our people in the history of our people, the great Rebbe Akiva, the great Rabban Gamliel, the great rabbis of our people, they were teachers, but they were also learners. And there were two episodes in the Haggadah, I think, that bring this to bear powerfully. One is we tell a story that there were five rabbis sitting in B'nai Brak having their Seder. And the Haggadah tells us, you know what, even if you already know the whole story, don't think you're exempted from spending your evening discussing the great miracles that God performed for our people. You should still engage in the full Seder and story process. And these rabbis took that guidance to heart so sincerely. What behavior did they model for themselves and for their students? They spent the entire night discussing the exodus from Egypt, even though presumably they already knew everything. One of the answers that's given is because you can never really know everything. One can always engage with his fellow and learn and tease out lessons. A second instance where I think this lesson of that the educator must him or herself also be a student is at the very end, sort of before, during, and after the Dayenu section of Haggadah, when there's a debate between the rabbis, well, exactly how many plagues were there in Egypt? Was it 10? Was it 40? Was it 50? Exactly how many plagues were there by the sea? The rabbis were bothered and tried to focus on every textual nuance to try to become students themselves and learn. Maybe there were even more miracles than I realized. Maybe the story of God's deliverance of our people was even more miraculous. And I think if we're prepared as parents and as educators to put ourselves in a role of student, in a role can I be available to learn and to take something away from this evening, then we've successfully modeled to our children that they too should be present as learners. We can't expect something from our children that we're not prepared ourselves to be authentically. Caroline, I'd love to, if I could, just share a, a complimentary thought or a, another thought that that picks up on what Rabbi Lutch um, just observed. I, I like the fact that you're pushing Rabbi Lutch against the idea that you know every question is equally good. We live in a in an age, you know, in a very egalitarian culture where every question is good. There's no such thing as a bad question. Well, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we we know that. We don't want to squash the spirit of inquiry, but we know that some questions are better than others, and some questions are not good questions. Uh, and I think what your insights have, have just helped us um, internalize is that there's a way, there's an art to asking a question. There's an art and a wisdom to asking the right question at the right time. And I think I, while I definitely share you know, that um that perspective, I, I do want to offer a somewhat alternative view of this question of seeking and finding or searching and finding and, and the value of the search qua search. Um, I just, this past Shabbos, I was very fortunate to have in our, in our minion at Lev Ladas in Teaneck, we had a wonderful guest. Uh, his name is Rav Raz. His name is Rav Raz Hartman from Yushalayim. Very Ehrlich, uh, very sincere, learned, wise, wise Jew, wise rabbi and teacher. And, and he, he shared a fascinating um, set of, of, of observations or, or uh, teachings. He said that there are two searches that are associated with Pesach, right? The search before Pesach is the search for Chametz. The search during the Seder on Pesach is the search for the Afikomen. And there are some interesting parallels and, and some differences. If you think about the search for the chametz, it's kind of a strange thing. We we purposely put out, you know, according to the great Kabbalist Arizal, ten specifically ten pieces. Others have different traditions, but we put out ten pieces, and then we go look for these pieces. Now, there's something that's very 
performative, very artificial in some sense, of this whole ritual. We're putting out the bread, the go search for the bread. He says something very obvious, and, and they're actually halachic questions, legal, Jewish legal questions. If you don't find all the pieces of bread, the, you had made a blessing, how do you know, what, what's, what do you do? Can you, can you really consider that blessing valid? But the bigger question thematically is, what are you doing? Like, is this for real? And he, he points out that the fact that we put this out, it's almost like a pantomime that we're trying to emphasize by putting out the bread and then searching that the real purpose of this is the search, not the finding itself. The finding is that we, why, why do we put it out? What do we need to find it for? We have it. But that the very act of the search is what's so significant in B'dikas Hamid. And in a similar way, the Avi Komen, Avi Komen, what is it called in the Seder order, in the names of the different parts of the ritual? It's called Safun, hidden. The Avi Komen is hidden because we don't always know if we get it, right? Who's the one, fi- is, it the, is it the parent? Is it the child who's hiding it? Every household has their own traditions and their own customs, but we don't know if we're going to find this, this Avi Komen. And the final point of this observation is that the same word, lechapes, to search, chofesh, to, to search is also freedom, chofshi, chofesh, freedom. That the very search itself is what grants us our freedom. The very ability to ask those questions, even if we might not arrive at the answers at all times, that itself is a level of freedom that we can't ignore and that we can't see as, as, as a less than. It's also significant that we're searching Obviously, Judaism believes in truth, believes in, in truths of a national level, a, a metaphysical level, a historical level, but that the search itself, the question itself, when posed well and in the spirit of inquiry, can be a very powerful thing on its own, even without a clear answer or a finding. There's the search, there's the question, and there's the answer three very central items at a Pesach Seder. And we've focused thus far on the search as you spoke so so cogently toward what Caroline was asking a little bit earlier, um, the questions. Um, but I also want to observe that not all answers are created equal either. Perhaps not all questions are created equal, perhaps, uh, but certainly not all answers are, crea- are created equally. And, and I'm mindful that, yes, as Caroline said, I, I find myself in, in very firm agreement that the ultimate educational authority is certainly not the government, and at the end of the day, it's not the school, but it's the Misawar community, the parental unit, the family unit that is that precious vehicle for the transmission of our tradition. But in order for that to be effective, certain ingredients, certain elements need to be present. I think part of what we already said, in fact, is that the children need to see the parents as learners themselves, you know, modeling behavior, noble behaviors that students, uh, that children can see in their parents is a very successful form of education. And in fact, we tell Jewish parents every year, and this is halakhically questionable for reasons we won't get into in this conversation, but we tell parents every year read the entire Haggadah, the Shabbos before Pesach, because you have this important sacrosanct responsibility that you will sit down to discharge, and you need to be prepared. There's no such thing as showing up without a lesson plan. It's insufferable enough when we go to classes like that, but you only have one set of parents. You only have one home in whose warm, nurturing walls you grow up. And so we say to the parents, have Rahmanis on your children. You need to prepare for the Seder. You can't come in cold. And I'm mindful where in the Haggadah is that idea itself evidenced. It's our response to the wise son. When the Chakram, the wise son, says, when are all of these statutes and rituals and rules that Hashem our God commanded us? What do we respond? We respond by giving him a specific halacha and a rationale. We say, if we have a child who's wise and interested enough to ask detailed questions, it's on us as parents 
to muster our full ability and faculties and respond in kind with real nuggets of information rather than just platitudes. But how are we supposed to know the answer? Well, the Haggadah is mandating that we invest in ourselves before we invest in our children. This is an educational orthodoxy that I think is not unique to the Jews, but uneducated people cannot possibly teach and instruct. And so there's a presupposition that parents and Seder participants have invested long before they sit down to Seder night. Hence, Caroline, the very gracious nature of your invitation to have this conversation. This is Seder boot camp, I suspect, for Rabbi Gottlieb and myself. Yes, well, in the spirit of investing in ourselves, I guess parents are now, now we're aware that this Shabbat will be reading the entire Haggadah. So thank you. And the Haggadah is a challenging liturgical piece. It's written in archaic language. It's long, esoteric. It takes many unexpected detours into intellectual discourse. It shares random accounts of debates between rabbis. Um, this makes our task ever more challenging as parents. So why is the Haggadah structured in such a complicated way? And what do you say to parents who might be intimidated by it? Rabbi Gottlieb, you want to go first? I'm torn between the traditionalist part of me that says, well, that's exactly what needs to be done. The the hard work of breaking your teeth, you know, literally and figuratively, we, we actually have, there's an allusion to breaking the teeth in, in the four sons that Rabbi Herschel just you know, invoke, we do that with the Russia, the, the, the wicked child, the wicked son. But I mean, thankfully we live, we live in an age where there's so many wonderful, we live in the golden age of Jewish publishing. There's so many Haggadahs, there's so many aids and reference guides to, to make the Haggadah more accessible. But I definitely invite, you know, the, the sturdy out there to really you know, take that leap and and try to look at the text. There are lots of good translations. There are lots of good commentaries. There's a tradition that many of you be, may be familiar with to every year buy a new Haggadah. So last year, I bought the graphic novel Haggadah uh, by Jordan Gorfinkel. It's a Koran, very, you know, well-acknowledged publisher. It's perhaps the, the finest Jewish publisher today of, of, of Jewish books of Svarim. And uh, it's love. It's wonderful. It brings through the graphic novels depiction. It it really makes the story come alive. And here, I don't think the purist wins this battle because if there's no student that's learning, there isn't any education that's being transacted. In other words, if 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 one stands on ceremony and one sticks to the script and only does the traditional text and doesn't have a way of making it come alive in some moment of an epiphany, some real engagement, some real connection, then that's a failure in the teacher. That's a failure in in the parent or the the individual leading leading the Seder. So on the one hand, I think Judaism is the people of, you know, we're the people of the book, the Jewish people, the people of the book, because we take books really seriously and we take our literacy seriously. As a nation, we we're proud that we're a very literate nation. That Jewish literacy goes back thousands of years to when Yeshua ben Gamla, you know, creates uh, the first public school system in the West um, for for Jewish children. But I, I think we fail if we only maintain that purist position and don't and don't try and, and reach the student where he or she is. Um, it's always, you know, the teacher, the student, and then the subject matter, and that. That kind of dialectic, we Rabbi Lutch mentioned the the question, the 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 answer, um, and the search. Here, there has to be that triangle of teacher, student, or child, and medium. You know, the 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 thing itself. And I think here we we're very gifted to be in an age where there's so much, so many, and find your own, find the one that speaks to you. Find the the Torah, find the Haggadah that that speaks to your soul um that's not that's not cheesy that's that's actually good education you could ask yourself a question and maybe you could even ask this at your seder if you're so inclined 
how many generations ago was the Exodus? And, you know, maybe it's a little bit more, maybe it's a little bit less, but it's about 125, 130 generations. It's not a very obtusely large number. It's 130 fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, et cetera, mothers, grandmothers, great-grandmothers, et cetera. It's not altogether that many generations removed. It's not thousands of generations. And a Haggadah, and, and I can't tell you what the publisher's intent is or is not, but almost every Haggadah preserves the traditional Hebrew or Aramaic text, and it may be alongside English-facing pages. In fact, the Haggadah I have here referencing for our conversation is both Hebrew and English. But there's a great element of authenticity that an original text brings to bear. And in fact, I think there's nothing that could be substituted for that level of authenticity. I find myself in deep agreement with Rabbi Gali that if a Seder transpires and the people are not inspired, they're in the shamos, their souls are not a little bit lit up by the by the, the shared experience, then it was a I, I'll, I'll, I'll use a, a severe term, but it was a swing and a miss. You know, maybe you did your best. I you say the failure. Ball, <laughs> fast and curved. I don't know. But but our, our mandate, our mandate, and this is a very difficult thing to achieve, but our mandate on Seder night, whether we are 119 years old or five years old, our mandate is to see that we have a role ourselves in the unfolding story of the Exodus. Because the Exodus, Caroline, everything will cycle back to your introduction because the Exodus isn't something that we only remember. It's something that I think it's not only that we remember and that we recreate, but that we are still living. We say, in fact, in Agatha, that had God not taken us out, we would all still be slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. There's an element that the Exodus is deeply personal and I'll share, I'm going to share my screen for a moment. I, I was shown this maybe about, I don't know, 11 or 12 years ago by a dear friend and neighbor. David Moss is a contemporary um, Jewish artist and in, in multiple media, but he has a lot of uh, lithographs and paintings. And he put out a Haggadah, cleverly named the David Moss Haggadah. Um, go figure. And one of the pains of that Haggadah, and for anybody interested, you could actually purchase this pain separately and frame it and put it on your wall, but it's a, it's a, it's a sheet from his Haggadah. We know that the Haggadah mandates us, and I want to read the words because we just made a plug for the authenticity of language. So the Haggadah tells us that we're not just remembering, but rather... We need to see in 2023, in whatever city or geography you find yourselves, that you are leaving Egypt. It's not something you're remembering. It's something that you're experiencing. And so David Moss affected this beautiful page, and I'll share it on my screen here. I hope you can see it. And these are the Hebrew words rendered. That you need to see today in your present reality that you're leaving Egypt. And there are two remarkable things I would have that you can see in this page. One, it's, it's maybe small on the screen. I'm going to make it a drop bigger. It may get blurry. But you can see that the mode of dress, the costume, of the people is changing generation over generation. You have biblical dress and uh, antiquity dress and medieval dress, and slowly, 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 as you get to the left, it becomes more and more modern costuming. But also, every other oval is empty. It's not rendered correctly on the computer screen, but if you actually hold the Haggadah, they're not empty ovals. They're mirrors. So you literally see yourself in the Haggadah underscoring in this artistic sense, and as Ruth Mark says very much, we're living in a golden age of Jewish publishing. You literally see yourself in the Haggadah. And if you were to show it to people, the entire Seder sees themselves in the Haggadah. 
and and this idea of of this is something that needs to be impactful but that we need to marry that impact with authenticity i think is a core message of seder night because if you take away the authenticity you know children have have very astute and keen radars for hypocrisy and no one's perfect we all aspire to be better and the best version of ourselves a lot of our our faith tradition is predicated on that being a lifelong process the idea of teshuva the idea of perpetual repentance and growth in life but that we should come with the sense of authenticity and by the way caroline couldn't we also suggest that one of the very worst educational lessons we could impart to our children is is that the tyranny of low expectations is alive and well in our homes shouldn't we say to our children oh this is difficult aspire to learn more so it's less difficult next year the challenge is in and of itself a tremendous educational blessing i think we need not be slavish to the word we need not feel if it doesn't work for our family that every single word of the Haggadah needs to be read and expounded and we have a Seder until four o'clock in the morning. If anybody's interested, we have seats at our table in Baltimore, Maryland. We're taking reservations for a Tuesday clock. night. Four uh, uh, finish. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, but but in fact, by the way, the Haggadah is sensitive that there are certain things that we must say. Rabban Gamliel famously says, if you don't say these three things, you haven't fulfilled your obligation. And there are certain things which are nice to say and they're additive to say. But the idea that we're starting with a rubric of traditionalism, and that's what has been passed down for 130 generations, is powerful. And maybe I'll just make a small math point. Somebody should fact check this. Let's say you pass down we got to like define terms for a moment. Let's say you pass down 98% of what you receive. Meaning you receive a tradition from your mother, from your father, and you successfully pass down the lion's share, the near entirety, 98%. After 130 generations, if there's an atrophy rate of 2% in every generation, that you're only preserving 98%. What percent of that original corpus of material do you have after 130 losing two percents? You have statistically nothing. You, you could do the math. You could do a regression where you're losing two percent every generation. You have nothing. Nothing. So strong is the obligation to path down to pass down authenticity because if you don't, if you find that that's negotiable in the snap of a intergenerational fingers, you lose it all. Rabbi Lutch, I just want to, when you were so beautifully you know, talking about that part of the Haggadah, which commands us to see ourselves as leading, leaving Egypt, and that is a difficult thing. You pointed out how difficult it is. And I guess I just want to share with our viewers and our listeners, Egypt is not just a historical or material reality. It's not just an ancient country that has a weak semblance of a modern, you know, incarnation in the in the the, the nation of, of of Egypt today or the Republic of Egypt today. Egypt is a state of being. Egypt is the word Mitzrayim. We know this is one of the most famous drashot on on Pesach, but Mitzrayim can mean the land of Egypt. It could also mean Meitzarim, from the straits, from the constraining places in our lives. When I first heard this, I think, this teaching, I, I thought it sounded like some hokey New Age teaching, like, you know, the, the consciousness, you know, the constricted consciousness, but it's so true that we, there, there's something in each of our lives that is preventing us from being the best Jew, the best human being, the best parent, the best child, the best husband, the best wife. There are things that get in the way of realizing our, of realizing our freedom. And that's what Pesach is about. It's Chagach Realizing our full freedom, 
our freedom from constraints, our freedom to aspire to our ideal, that is the freedom that is longing to, to break us out of the Egypt that each of us can be free of. We each can, we, we may not have left Egypt physically, but according to the traditions, the mystical traditions, our souls did leave Egypt and our souls today can experience a bit, a taste of that freedom when we lose ourselves from those, those pathologies, those dysfunctions, those things that get in the way of us being the best versions of the Jews, of the human beings that, that we are. And that to me is, is the way that we can actually fulfill that, that command, that, that, that ideal, that principle of, of seeing ourselves as free because we can be free. We can make ourselves free from the things that, that constrain us. And, and of course, it's not only freedom from, but it's freedom for. The Jewish conceptualization of freedom is the ability and the resources and the self-determination to be our best self, to be our most noble, most spiritual self. The, the whole idea of al-tikra chavrus el that through the giving of the law, we actually become free. We become empowered and available to be who we are. But Catalan, I want to go back and make one more point, if you tell me time allows, for questions. Sure. Questions? Okay. okay. Questions okay. that you're going to ask. Yes. My nine-year-old son, Binyamin, last week, he came home from school with an assignment, which was to you know, create and, and write, he's a fourth grader, to create and write a thought, a, a Torah thought, a Devar Torah related to the Haggadah. And I said, wow, this sounds like this, what a, what a fun, what a great assignment. What do you think you want to write about? He said, well, I, I know the question that I, that I want to try to answer. I think something's bothering me. I said, okay, Binyamin, what's, what's on your mind? He said, well, the second plague is called Sfardea that we normally translate as frogs, that frogs came out of the Nile and sort of went everywhere. There were frogs in the nose and frogs on the toes and frogs in the ovens and frogs in the bed, frogs everywhere. He said, but some people say that Sfardea is crocodile. So what's the deal? Why do some people say it's frogs? And why do some people say it's crocodiles? And where do they get it from? And how come? And which one was it? And I said, you know, Binyamin, I, I don't know a whole lot about that is the truth, but why don't we call our rabbi together? And so uh, we called and he was, oh, great, good idea. So we called Rabbi Samuels and uh, my my dear father figure and, and beloved and revered teacher, uh, a, a congregational rabbi in metropolitan Boston. And he probably spent 30 minutes. I kid you not. This is a rabbi in the run up to Pesach, probably spent 30 minutes over over Zoom, talking about where do we know it's frogs and where do we know it's crocodiles. It turns out the crocodiles comes from the Abarbanel, the great 15th century Spanish rabbi, and he has a textual uh, reason for, for offering that maybe it's crocodiles and not frogs, but beyond the scope of our conversation here. But Caroline, the, the, the greatest contribution we can make, I think, to the continuity of our people by by having our young people show up and bring their full selves is for us to tell them that they matter and that their questions matter. And whether it's at home or it's in a classroom, it's miserable and unforgivable educational malpractice to snuff the spark out of a young mind. And all too often we have our agenda. I think this was my learned colleague Rav Mark's point that all too often we have our agenda and we have what we want to get through and we have the Haggadah that we want to say and the Seder that we want to have miss the mark altogether. We need to find ways to enfranchise the young people around our table so that fast forward 30, 40, 50 years when they're sitting at the head of the table then they're looking at the generations of their family in front of them a, that they're going to want to sit at the head of the table, and B, they're going to be their, their, their Jewish progeny sitting around the table with them. Rabbi Lutz, what a beautiful 
parting thought for us. I'll ask you, Rabbi Gottlieb, is there any section or phrase of the Haggadah that you find to be the most powerful that you'd like to leave our parents with? Thanks, Caroline. Yeah, I I love this line in, in Dayenu. Dayenu is a pretty cool song, even without the exegesis and the explanations and the commentary, but there is a line in in Dayenu, which is pretty puzzling on on face, you know, on on the surface, it says, "Ilu kervanu lifnei har Sinai below nasan lanu es a Torah Dayenu." That had God brought us to the foot of Mount Sinai, but not given us the Torah, it would have been enough. And when you think about that, it, it sounds like a big tease, like God would have brought us enough for that. What was yeah, that? The whole point of right? Mount Sinai to get the Torah, right? Isn't that the whole point? So this would be like the greatest, cruelest trick that God could ever devise for the Jewish people. Why would he bring us to Sinai and not give us the Torah? And why would we say that's enough? So Rabbi Soloveitchik teaches this and Rabbi Lamb in his um, teachings uh, adapts this the same Torah. In When it comes to teaching, and we've been spending a lot of our time today talking about the, the pedagogic dimensions of the Haggadah and the Seder, when it comes to teaching, there are really two dimensions to all teaching. The first is the content, the limud ha-Torah, the actual cognitive content of the words, the ideas, the concepts that the Torah transmits to us. And that's one level of Torah. But there's something else, what's called Masoras ha-Torah, the experience of the Torah, the giving over of the Torah, the, the communion of the Torah, the communion of the Masora that meets the human being when he is feeling revelation apart from or a moment separated from the content. And so what Rabbi Salvejic is saying is, is, is a radical teaching that there are really two parts and that those two parts are distinct. There's the Torah itself, the content, and there's the way in which the Torah is taught, the way in which the Torah is transmitted, the fashion, the ambiance, the allure, the romance. That is a separate concept of Talmud Torah that's equally important. And that's what the teaching of the Dayenu is, that had God just brought us to Sinai, that yes, it would have been better, of course, to have the Torah, but it's to teach us the significance of that encounter with God, that encounter face-to-face -face with our Creator, face-to-face -face with the ultimate reality. And that's what the Seder is really all about. It's to have that encounter with God, the encounter with Torah, the encounter with your tradition, with your Masora, with the the not just the history, but the memory. That's what the Seder night is really all about, to experience, to cultivate the highest possibility, the highest awareness of that Masora the Torah, the conveying of the Torah, the mood, that sense of culture, ambiance, how you feel when you take in the Torah. If that if we can create that with our children at the Seder table, then it's the rest is gravy. <laughs> the rest is, <laughs> is chametz nope. free. Dayenu, chametz free gravy. Dayenu, Dayenu. What what Rabbi Gottlieb just shared, I want to underscore from a from a different textual proof. The exact same point, which for me is the most powerful word in the entire Haggadah, by far. The Haggadah that I have that I brought to the office today for this conversation is the Art Scroll Masora series, The Family Haggadah. This is a family and budget-friendly Haggadah. I think it costs oh, old three dollars. <laughs> old faith. That, that is a Haggadah that we use in my home, Rabbi Lach. There you well, go. That, know it very, very well. It is the Brick Family Haggadah and the Lutch Family Haggadah. Um, on page 46, this is on page 46, it takes you a long time to get to page 46. When you're at page 46, you're basically done with the whole agata, and it's almost time for the meal because this this says you start eating on page 48. So you're page 46, you're almost done. Whether you've been saying the Haggadah for an hour or for four hours or for whatever, whatever you do in your home for 30 minutes, whatever it is, you're on page 46. You've told over the entire story. And then what does the Haggadah say? as a preposition, and it's the most important word in the entire agada, as Rabbi Gottlieb just told us that we need to feel something in our heart. And the word is lefichach, therefore. 
We're not just remembering something that's irrelevant. The Haggadah wants us to know that there's a therefore. And the therefore is, in the words of the Haggadah, again quoting for authenticity, etc. Therefore, it is on us. We are obligated. Who's the we? The we. Us, the people sitting around our own Seder table, we're obligated to praise and to extol and to make great God who wrought all of these miracles for us and for our forebearers. If we can't make that transition from recitation of something that happened to, well, therefore, my life needs to be different, therefore, I have obligation, therefore, I'm going to live a different life, then we've not been successful in our Seder efforts, in our Seder worship, in our Seder instruction. So it's that it's that preposition of, therefore, I'm obligated to do something, and that's to live a life of spiritual nobility, of feeling, to use the word of my learned colleague. Only we all succeed in making that very important transition um, at our seders with our families in the coming week. Thank you, Rabbi Gottlieb. Thank you, Rabbi Lutch, for enlightening us and inspiring us, for opening up our minds, and for allowing us as parents to take real ownership and accountability for our own learning so that we can model it and be our best selves at our seders. So thank you so much, and I look forward to speaking to you again. Thank, thank you, Caroline. And a happy Passover. Happy, pa happy Passover. Passover. Passover.